All right, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Sunday Night Edition. It's our great pleasure to bring you Dr. Tamara Petrosian, who is an Associate Clinical Professor at SUNY College of Optometry and Primary Care, Ocular Disease, Pediatrics, and Vision Therapy Departments. Very, very broad, uh, broad experiences. She lectures internationally and has published articles and book chapters on various topics. She has helped implement free pediatric exams for over 3,000 children through the Armenian Eye Care Project, developed over a dozen vision therapy workup, book workbooks, and helped start and previously worked with NTO Health, where she has developed all the vision therapy content. I think very impressively, she is in, she's helping develop the first Armenian Optometric Association. She's the infancy, uh, infancy liaison for New Jersey, head of clinical care committees for pediatrics and vision therapy, and previously on the board of directors of New Jersey Society of, Society of Optometric Physicians. Among others, she's been awarded Young Optometrist of the Year and Optometrist of the Year from the New Jersey Society of Optometric Physicians and Young Optometrist of the Year from the AOA. So it's really our great privilege and pleasure to welcome Dr. Tammy Petrosian to talk about ocular complications in systemic diseases. And uh, with that, Tammy, please take it away. Tammy, you're, you're muted. Okay. Can I, can you hear me now? Very good. And a no apparent okay. feedback. Beautiful. Okay. And you can also see my screen. Indeed. Yes, we can. Okay. Very good. Um, so just my, my disclosures, um, nothing we're going to be talking about today has um, anything to do with any um, commercial products that or companies that I am associated with. And as Greg likes to, you know, say my commitments. So these are these are my four commitments that I have on top of all of my disclosures. So our outline for today is reviewing pharmacology in general, and then we're going to touch on ocular anatomy and physiology to figure out exactly how the medication that we take systemically gets into the eyes. And then we're really going to delve into about 40 different classes of medication that we see our patients taking and might ourselves be taking um, systemically that can have an effect on our eyes. And a lot of really good references coming straight from the FDA um, and other websites, as well as uh, the drug companies themselves. In terms of why are we reviewing adverse drug reactions, 64% of visits to a physician ends up in some kind of a prescription. If you are going to an outpatient hospital, it's higher, and up to 80% of patients walk out with a prescription from an emergency room. In 2009, there were about 4 billion prescriptions filled, and in 2021, that went up to about 6.5 billion prescriptions filled for the United States. When we look at our seniors, they obviously have more chronic diseases, they have multiple conditions, and so they're using more prescriptions, and they're also using more over-the-counter drugs. If we look at seniors below 80 years old, about 77% of them will have one or more chronic disease for which they're taking a medication, and that goes up to over 85% in our patients over 80 years old. And in our seniors, adverse drug reactions to the medications they're taking is one of the top five greatest threats to their health. In terms of adverse drug reaction or non-compliance of medication use, that facilitates about 28% of hospitalizations for our elderly patients. In terms of how the drug that we take systemically actually moves through the body and gets to the eye and causes adverse ocular effects, it depends on how the drug is actually taken. So if a drug is taken orally versus inhaled versus injected, it's going to move around the body in different ways. So if we have a drug taken orally, it's first gonna go to the liver, then it's gonna get broken down and then go to the site of action versus if something is inhaled or injected, it has a little bit stronger action because it first goes to the site and then goes to the liver and, and gets more broken down. So it does depend how the patient is taking the medication that they're taking. 
in terms of our blood flow. So we have the blood going through um, our heart. So it goes through the superior and inferior vena cavas into the right atrium, to the right ventricle, then going to the right and left pulmonary arteries to go to the lungs where it gets oxygenated, back down to the right and left pulmonary veins, to the left atrium and ventricle, and then over to our aorta. So from the aorta, we have the arch over here, we have the brachiocephalic artery, and we have the left common carotid. So our carotids are going to come up and they are going to break into the um, right and left internal and external carotids. And then we are going to go up the ophthalmic artery and um, uh, up the internal carotid and break off to the ophthalmic artery, which is where we have innervation or blood flow to all of our eye and our adnexa, as well as some of the vasculature on the outside of the lid tissues as well. So that's blood flow going or how the medication is getting to the eye. And if we think about the eye structure itself, it is a very, very small organ with a lot of different types of tissue that has an extremely rich blood supply for its mass. So whatever medication is floating around in your blood is really going to go into the eye and affect it in possibly a negative way. In terms of how the drug actually gets out of the eye, it depends on how it got in there. So if it's going entering through the uveal circulation, it's gonna exit out of the Schlem canal, the ciliary body, or it's going to diffuse into the adjacent structures. And if it went in through the retinal circulation, then it's going to exit through the retinal vein, it's going to diffuse into your vitreous, or it's going to get actively transported out. So if we think about how a medication can actually get out of your blood vessels and get to the ocular tissue, the ability of the drug to penetrate those major blood vessels is going to determine how likely it is to affect your ocular tissues as well as your visual function. So we have the blood-brain barrier. These are those tight junctions that restrict large molecular weight drugs from passing through. And we have the blood aqueous barrier, and these are the fenestrations that prevent large molecules and lipid insoluble molecules from passing through. But if we look at our vasculature in the choroid, in the sclera, in the ciliary body, very small lipid soluble drugs can very easily pass and they can diffuse into the avascular structures that we have in the eye, such as the lens, the cornea, and um, the meshwork as well. So a drug molecule that enters the eye through your circulation is either going to come out of the eye or it's going to actually accumulate inside of the eye and start to potentially cause problems. And the major accumulation sites are going to be our more avascular sites like the cornea, the lens, and the vitreous, or the vascular retina. In terms of determinants of adverse drug reactions, so it really depends on what is the nature of the drug, how much are you taking, how long have you been using for? Again, how are you taking it? Is it oral? Is it injected? Do you have any allergy to the drug molecules itself? And how many medications are you taking? So polypharmacy is where we have four or more medications. Once we start taking four or more medications, then the absorption, the distribution of the medication, the metabolism of all the different medications, as well as how those medications are excreted is going to change. And so you can have a much higher rate of adverse drug reactions the age and the gender of the patient, the health status, as well as individual genetic responses, individual patient responses are all going to determine what the adverse effects of the medication are going to be. So in terms of our role as optometrists with our patients, it's up to us to really be familiar with the associated ocular as well as visual side effects of the common medications that we're going to be talking about, because a lot of the time the prescribing doctor might not be. They have a lot of other adverse drug effects that they might be much more concerned about, systemic side effects that they might be more aware of or concerned about. And a lot of times it's actually very difficult to figure out what the specific ocular or visual side effect is going to be, because unless you really talk to the pharmaceutical reps unless you understand the pharmacology of the medication. And with a lot of these, you really need to delve in. So a side effect could be vision blur that's listed, but is it vision blur because of cycloplegia, because of macular edema, because of corneal haze? You really need to delve in very deep to figure out what that vision blur might be due to. So those prescribing doctors are not necessarily going to be going into those specific details. So that's on us. 
It's also very important to make sure that you understand the medications the patients are taking. And a lot of times they might be taking a systemic medication and they don't tell you about it because, well, this is the eye doctor. Why do they need to know about my diabetes medication? But again, it's very important, but also very important to consider the over-the-counters as well. And we'll talk about several over-the-counters that can cause severe ocular complications. There are almost about 30 new drugs that come out every year, so we really don't want to familiarize ourselves with the generic or the brand names. You will get used to them as you see patients taking them more and more often, but really pay much more closer attention to the mm -hmm. class medication because the classes are going to usually have very similar side effects. And if you do see an ocular visual side effect with your patients, just like with anything else, we really don't want to tell the patient to discontinue the medication because a lot of the time the medication they're taking can be life-saving, can be um, necessary for them to function day to day. So we really want to talk to the prescribing physician, maybe consider offering some other medication classes that the patient might want to consider taking because the benefits of taking the medication outweighs the side effects in most cases. And so it's on us to really manage the side effects um, and be able to allow the patient to continue taking the medication. General rules and regulations in terms of ocular side effects for systemic medications um, is that your side effects are going to be bilateral. They can be asymmetric, but because this is a systemic medication, it's getting to both of the eyes, you're going to have bilateral side effects. The adverse drug reaction will usually start within the first couple of weeks to months. And then for most medications, if they don't actually cause any type of permanent damage to the cells or the tissue, the adverse drug effect will resolve after weeks to months of discontinuing the medication. So we are going to be talking about medications that are used for all of these different types of um, systemic diseases. We are going to touch upon, upon all of them. And as you, as you can tell, I talk very fast. So out of the 40 different classes of medication, um, the number one, I broke it down in terms of what the side effect, the common side effects are. So the most common side effect out of all these 40 classes is blurry vision. What it's due to varies, but blurry vision is listed as the primary ocular side effect. Dry eye, visual field defects, color vision and contrast, optic neuropathy and diplopia being the second most common side effect. So let's dive in and start talking about our cardiovasculars. Before we dive in, we are going to just make sure you guys are paying attention with our first poll question. It is launched. Ocular adverse drug reactions frequently depend on medication dosage and duration of use. True or false? Nothing has rolled into the chat box for a question yet, so we'll keep okay. an eye on that for Perfect. you. I will, as I already told you before, that's my reminder mm -hmm. to send the handout. But we have a high percentage already, so I'm just going to end the poll. Okay. I'll share the results. You should be able to see those results now. Let me see. Let me go back to, okay, beautiful. So true. Yes. So depending on the um, frequency, the dose, um, the duration, it, we're going to have potentially different side effects for the medication. So let's start off with our cardiovasculars, starting with the statin. So this is our lovastatin, niacin, simostatin, atrovastatin that your patients frequently take. These are prescribed for high cholesterol or cardiovascular disease. So these work to inhibit the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme, and pretty much that is going to decrease production of cholesterol in your liver like it normally does. This drug also works as a peripheral vascular dilator, and it can also cause some muscle weakness um, we don't really know what the mechanism is for that, but it can cause muscle weakness and as well as twitching of the muscles and muscular pain. So because of the vasodilation, we can have pseudocystoid macular edema. So all the vessels are dilated. We can start having seepage of fluid and get macular edema. More common to happen in males in the younger, younger adult population, 30s to 50s. And the vision loss is reversible once the medication is discontinued within the, the next few days. Because of the vasodilation, we can also get edema to the lid. So we can have ptosis for the patient. 
There is also irritation and dry eye or contact lens intolerance in about a fifth of the patient. And because of the muscle weakness, we can also get ptosis because of that. So we have two different mechanisms for the ptosis, as well as possibly some restriction to EOM movement. So we can have diplopia, we can have a palsy because of the muscle weakness. Some studies say that statins cause cataract. Um, so that's where the blurry vision, aside from the macular edema, could be coming from. But that is, um, there's a lot of debate there. Um, but the statins, if a patient is diabetic as well, the statins can actually cause macular edema in our diabetic patients. So you can get vision blur because of that. With our beta blockers, so these are your LALs, so Bataxolol, Metropolol, Latinolol, these are prescribed for hypertension, congestive heart failure, and angina, as well as arrhythmia, high cholesterol. The beta blockers are found in the eye. Uh, beta receptors are found in the eye, both the beta 1 as well as the beta 2 type of receptors we have in the eye. And the beta blockers, as we know, are going to cause dry eye because they decrease the production of uh, tears. So we have a decreased amount of tear secretion causing dry eye, contact lens intolerance, as well as decreasing the amount of aqueous that's formed in the ciliary body, so bringing down the IOP in our patients. Our glycosides, so digoxin is a medication that's prescribed for congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and the way it works is it inhibits the sodium and the potassium ATPase that we have in all of our cells. So the strength of the heart contractions is going to increase, and that will then decrease the heart rate for the patient. Because of the change in the ATPase, we're going to have a lot of side effects ocularly with our glycosides. We are going to have a decrease in aqueous humor production, so that's going to bring down the IOP. We have inhibition of the sodium-potassium ATPase in the ciliary um, epithelium, which is then going to reduce the, pr the production of aqueous. Scotomas can happen because we have the sodium potassium pumps altering the levels um, and causing electrical disturbances in the retina, especially in our bipolar and mueller cells. And so we can start having scotomas or difficulties on or prolonged B wave on our ERGs, as well as causing a retrobulbar optic neuritis where we have the pain, blurry vision, APD, visual field defects, as well as contrast and color vision changes. In up to a quarter of the patients, we can start getting cone deficiency. So these patients can come in complaining visual snow, red green colored uh, deficiencies, a yellow tinge or xanthopia. So Van Gogh actually, right? This is Van Gogh. Um, he was on a glycoside during his yellow period. So that's why all of his paintings while he was on the glycosides are tinted yellow because that's how he saw the world. Um, and this is actually reversible once the patient goes off the glycosides. Antiarrhythmatics, so this is our amiodarone. This is prescribed for both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. It's the most commonly prescribed antiarrhythmatic in the United States, and it works to prolong the cardiac action potentials. It also is structurally very similar to um, our T4, so it can have um, an overactive thyroid simulation for as if the patient has an overactive thyroid. With these, this is one of the ones that will cause the world keratopathy that we can see on the corneas. Almost 100% of the patients using the antiarrhythmatics for more than six months will get this world-like keratopathy. The UV light will fixate the drug's metabolites to the lipids within the epithelial cells, which grow from the limbus to the center of the cornea in this world-like shape, and that's why you get that world-like um, appearance. Just a quick note on uh, oral keratopathy. The severity is dose dependent. So the higher the dose, the longer you've been taking it for, you're going to have a much more dense oral keratopathy. This does resolve once the drug is discontinued after about six months or so. Um, but the thing to note here is if you have a patient that is not taking out a medication that causes oral keratopathy, and there's a few of them, which we'll talk about, and you see oral keratopathy on the patient, they're not taking a medication that causes it, and they haven't had, I've also seen oral keratopathy 
uh, in patients that have had severe corneal trauma. So like most of their epithelium has been sloughed off. And as the, from the trauma, as the epithelium regrows, you can get this whirl like little configuration. But if they don't have either one of those, then you have to make sure to send the patient for a workup for Fabry's disease, which is lysosomal storage disease, which can cause progressive cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, renal disease, and, and death. So at this point, um, before we didn't use to, but we do now have genetic testing as well as medication for Fabry's disease. So making it even that much more important for us to make sure the patient gets worked up if we see that world keratopathy without a uh, medication cause for it. So pretty much what happens when we take these medications is... Um, we're pretty much causing a type of lipid, lipid storage dysfunction in the patient when they take the medication, then causing this form of oral keratopathy. In terms of side effects, it really depends on how severe the keratopathy is. Most patients won't have any side effects. About half of them will report some photophobia, maybe some blue-green rings around lights. Some will complain of blurry vision, but the um, antiarrhythmatics can also cause an anterior subcapsular lens opacity right within the pupillary area, right within the visual axis. So that's going to decrease vision much more significantly than the world. Anterior ischemic optic neuropathy does occur in about 2% of patients because there is going to be a decrease in axoplasmic flow, causing accumulation of inclusion bodies in the optic nerve, causing optic nerve edema. But is this actually due to the medication or did the patient already um, have other susceptibilities to the anterior ischemic optic neuropathy? We're not really sure, but just something to look out for, especially with your patients with much smaller, smaller nerves. And this optic nerve edema may last months after the medication is discontinued because amiodarone does have such a long half-life. And just something to uh, think back to, if you have a patient with very severe cardiovascular disease, they might be put on amiodarone as well as the joxin. Remember with the joxin, we had an increased risk of retrobulbar optic neuritis. So if they're on both medications, then we might have... Um, a little bit more cautious in terms of making sure we're dilating and taking a look at their optic nerve. Our thiazides and diuretics. So this is our hydrochlorothiazide that we see our patients taking. These are prescribed for congestive heart failure, hypertension, and these work to prevent reabsorption of both sodium and chloride in your kidneys. They increase excretion of water from the body. And what these can cause are things like dry eye, they can either initiate or worsen a band keratopathy that's already started. But the thing that is much more relevant to us, potentially vision threatening, um, very rare to happen, is uh, choroidal effusion. So what we are going to have with choroidal effusion, we get very acute bilateral large shift in myopia. So we're talking about six to eight diopters. We're going to have a mid-dilated pupil angle closure glaucoma because what's happening is the medication is going to cause the cord to effuse, meaning it's going to leak fluid and it's going to happen in the back of the eye as well as in the front of the eye. So everything is literally going to get pushed forward, including your iris, including your ciliary body, including your choroid in the back of the eye. So the patient is going to come in with headaches, severe pain, decrease in vision, very high IOPs, a very, very narrow, shallow interior chamber. Um, and it's because everything is just leaking fluid. So you're going to have a patient come in with this angle closure, a severe spike in their IOPs, but it's not due to your normal um, classic angle closure. It's because you were having choroidal effusion. So the treatment here um, is we want to cyclopelage. So the cyclopelagics are going to help relax the sorry body, move that iris lens um, complex posterior. So we're going to open the depth of the anterior chamber. We want to use steroids so that we can decrease the amount of leakage or effusion that's, uh, that's happening to stabilize the cell membrane, as well as lowering the IOP topically. It's very, very important when you have a patient come in with a um, angle closure, you need to take your 90, uh, 90 lens and take a look at the back of the eye because if that angle closure is due to a choroidal effusion and not just your classic angle closure, what can happen is 
for some of us, our go-to with an angle closure is Diamox to bring the IOP down, oral Diamox. The issue with that is that Diamox is a sulfa medication. Sulfa medications themselves can actually cause worsening in a leakage or choroidal effusion. So if the patient has a, um, a narrow, a very, very shallow angle closure due to choroidal effusion spike in IOPs, we do not want to give them a diamox to bring that pressure down. We do not want to give them myotics such as pilocarpine because that's going to bring everything even more forward and close things off even more. So we need to do cycloplegics, we need to do steroid and topical IOP. So always remember to look at the back of that eye before starting the patient on diamox with an angle closure. Our anticoagulants are going to be prescribed for preventing clot formation, especially in AFib, and to treat and prevent thrombosis. These work to prevent synthesis of the clotting factors that we have in the blood. And so if our blood is not clotting, we're going to much more likely hemorrhage both in the front as well as in the back of the eye, especially with just rubbing or very mild trauma. If there is hemorrhaging in the back of the eye, depending on where the hemorrhage is, you can have blurry vision, you can have visual field defects. Consideration in our wet AMD patients, it's um, unknown if aspirin use may be associated with increased risk of neovascular AMD. So just a consideration for your patients because we do have a lot of patients taking over-the-counter aspirin. And then anticoagulants uh, are always going to be a consideration if the patient is going for surgery. So the surgeon definitely needs to know about it. We are going to- Tammy, yes. mm -hmm. Tammy before, before you go on, two things. Yes. Uh, one, a question came in, Bango yes. also drank lots of ab absinthe. Does that uh -huh. affect vision? Um, absinthe, I, I believe, I, I have to check, so don't quote me on it, but I do believe you can get um, toxic um, optic neuropathy from overuse of it, I believe. Okay. And the other thing, I'm going to go back to the cardiac glycosides. As you mentioned, it shuts down the sodium potassium pumps. Is that correct? Yes. Well, I'm not sure if you've encountered this, but I've encountered it a number of times. The most recent time was Wednesday. Uh -huh. uh, and there's something out there. And I think per personally, to me, this is more, you, oh, you, you don't have to go back. That's okay. You don't have to go yeah, back. Yeah, I, I went back and now I'm going, yeah. I'm going front again. Yep. Yeah. The, uh, Personally, I find I find this at least my area more existential crisis than uh, than than the climate change. It's milkweed toxicity. Milkweed and toxicity. Sure, milk, yeah, and, and let me share that with you and the audience. Uh huh. Milk, milkweed is a plant. It's a weed that feeds the monarch butterfly. Okay. The, cater the caterpillars will eat it, and they become poisonous. Things can't eat it without becoming ill. Okay. Monarch butterflies are poisonous. Not venomous, uh -huh. but poisonous. Uh -huh. If something ingests them, they're going to get sick. And it's from, from milkweed. Milkweed is a cardiac glycoside. And I probably have one or two patients a month that comes in like this between my, my wife, my wife. Are they eating the caterpillars? What are they doing with those caterpillars? No, they're, 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 they're lepidopterists, people who, uh, who cultivate butterfly gardens. Uh-huh. And what they do is they they're they're pulling out their milkweeds. It gets on their hands into their eye, uh -huh. and the, character, the characteristic is massive decimase folds, massive corneal edema. Uh -huh. The patient I saw, she came in. She was very very anxious. Twenty one hundred vision. Yeah, you know, I I mean, as soon as I saw, without even asking her, I knew what it was. I, I've seen so many of these cases down here in Florida, and she started to talk about. You know, she she has a butterfly garden. Said, "Stop right there! It's milkweed toxicity. A steroid. And I put her on a steroid four times mm -hmm. a day on mm -hmm. Wednesday. On Friday, she was twenty thirty and hardly had any folds at all. Just a little bit of residual uh, residual edema. That's so if, great. If if you ever see a patient with massive edema, folds no. uh -huh. in decimates, always ask about milkweed toxicity." And ask if they're quote unquote lepidopterous because they're you know they're they're fond of butterflies. So, well, I'm that's actually, a new vocabulary word for me, lepidopterous. I'll, I'll give you another new vocabulary word because I've treated so many of these. I consider myself a lepidoptometrist. <laughs> I, I, I practice lepidoptometry. <laughs> oh, 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to mute now. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So speaking of psychiatric, no, um, we're going to jump into the, the psychiatric medications. So these are definitely very much on the rise, especially in our pediatric patients. Unfortunately, we are seeing a very large rise in antidepressants, tricyclic antidepressants, antipsychotics um, with our preteens, with our teenager patients, especially um, during and after this, this COVID pandemic that, that we had. In terms of our emotional well-being, it's really all a balance between our norepinephrine, our dopamine, and our serotonin systems to give us our mood in terms of are we able to feel, feel good about ourselves. So it's all really a balanced system. And whatever is going on in terms of the, the condition that is being treated, it's usually a disbalance between these three, the norepinephrine, the dopamine, and serotonin. And that's what the medication is usually trying to balance out. So uh, a big one that we see a lot of our patients taking, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. So this is the Paxil, Effexor, Prozac, Zoloft. These are used for anything from menopause to depression, PMS, anxiety, OCD, PTSD, bulimia. They are SSRIs, but they do have anti anticholinergic properties as well. So because of the anticholinergic properties, we're really going to be cycloplegic these patients. So if they, they're going to have medriasis, right, but if they already have a more narrow angle, they can have a spike in their IOPs due to um, even more narrowing of that angle. They're going to be cycloplegic dilated, so we're going to have photophobia. There's going to be a decrease in tear secretion due to the um, anticholinergic, so dry eye, contact lens intolerance, and then depending on their prescription, whether they're myopic, hyperopic, they're definitely going to have near vision blur, but potentially distance vision blur as well. And then these patients can also have diplopia as well as conjunctivitis and ptosis separately and secondary to the SSRIs that they're taking. High dose antihistamines are also another medication that is being used for our patients for anxiety, tension, psychoneurosis. So we know antihistamines are used for a lot of different things, but a high dose antihistamine is actually being used for anxiety and for tension. So this is going to block the histamine action and regulate or calm down the normal neuronal function. And it does also have some serotonin antagonistic properties. So that's why it's being used. It does actually have a very large addictive uh, component to it. So you might have patients that were given this medication and they became addicted. And so they're buying the medication now off market or they're stealing it from their sister, their mother, their neighbor, whatever it might be. So just be, be cognizant of that. Again, anticholinergic effects. So everything we get with um, cycloplegia. The patient is also going to be drowsy, some dizziness, some constipation. So if you have a patient coming in, dilated pupils, potentially a little bit of an elevated IOP, cycloplegia, they can also be complaining of nausea, some dizziness because of the high-dose antihistamines. Our benzos, the benzodiazepines, so this is the Xanax, Valium, Ativan. These are prescribed for extreme tension, extreme anxiety, as well as patients with sleep disorders. And these work to enhance GABA. So GABA is the chief inhibitory neurotransmitter in our nervous system. So if we're increasing GABA, we're actually decreasing all neuronal firing within our nervous system. So this really dampens everything down altogether. And then again, so you know, you're seeing a pattern, these are going to have anticholinergic properties. So because we have a increase in GABA, and the GABA will decrease all neuronal firing, including neuronal firing in the eye. As we know, our saccades or pursuits are very quick and they need very quick neuronal firing. And so if we have a dampening of our neuronal firing, then we are going to start having a deficit or dysfunction in our saccades and in our pursuits. A difficulty with EOM function, so the patient can have diplopia, especially on changing gaze. So everything that comes along with the cycloplegia. We also can have CNS stimulants. So here, instead of being an anticholinergic, we're in turn stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. So that's our Adderall and our Ritalin prescribed for ADHD, for narcolepsy. And these are mild cortical stimulants. So they increase concentration of dopamine, of norepinephrine, and they stimulate 
the sympathetic nervous system. So we're not necessarily going to have cycloplegia, but we are going to have medriasis, we are going to have dry eyes, and because of the medriasis, the patient might complain of blurry vision as well, but they're not going to be cycloplegic. So their accommodative system is fine and fully functioning. The CNS stimulants had a lot of systemic side effects, so then they developed non-stimulants that were not central nervous system stimulants. So these are next generation stimulants, such as our clonidine and guanfacine. So these again are going to be sympathomimetic and they are prescribed for our patients with ADHD, as well as they work really well for patients that are going through withdrawal, either from opioids or from alcohol. So you'll see those, those patients being on the medication as well. And this is one of those uh, medications where your genetics really comes into play. So if you have an eye where you have a lot more alpha-1 receptors, it's going to cause a different side effect than if you have an eye or your genetics has more alpha-2 receptors. So this medication is both an alpha-2 as well as an alpha-1 agonist. So if you have more alpha-2 receptors in your eye, then it's going to actually constrict your pupil and it is going to decrease your IOP. But if you, you're genetically, your eye has more alpha-1 receptors, then you're actually going to have an increase in your pupil size, medriasis, as well as dry eye. So this is an, uh, an interesting example of how your genetics really plays into the side effects that you might have um, for the medications that you're taking. Another um, next level non-CNS stimulant is going to be our Stratera. So this is one of those that's FDA approved for ADHD, but it is really given off-label for a lot of different things like eating disorders, cognitive dysfunction, mood disorders, and again, to help with withdrawals for addictions. So instead of being an SSRI, this is a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, SNRI. And it works mainly in the prefrontal cortex. It increases adrenergic neurotransmission. So it's a sympathomimetic. Because we're increasing the sympathetics, we are again going to get medriasis, potential increase in IOP. If we already have a narrow angle photophobia, we're going to get dry eye, again, due to a decrease in secretion, as well as we're, uh, we're simulating the sympathetic. So a little bit of eyelid retraction blurred vision from the medriasis, as well as vasoconstriction. Our phenothiazine, so this is the things like uh, Merrillil and Thorazine. We really don't see these being prescribed as much because of the severe systemic as well as ocular side effects, but they still work really well for our schizophrenic patients with uh, severe depression with a lot of anxiety. These are dopamine receptor antagonists, and they also have anticholinergic and antihistamine properties. The thing that's really visually devastating is the compound itself is phototoxic. So when you have the um, compound in the tissue and it becomes exposed to UV, it's going to kill off and damage the tissue. So because of the anticholinergics, we get everything we get with cycloplegia, but with the phototoxic effects, we can start getting changes to the retina. So we can start having poor scotopic vision. Um, we can start getting changes to our cornea. We have um, lysis of the corneal endothelium, so severe corneal edema. We can get pigmentation on all the interior structures of the eye because of the drug accumulation within the tissues, up to 80% of the patients are going to get this very central, really dense, stellate anterior subcapsular cataract, which is really going to interfere with their vision. And then again, because of the phototoxic effects, the medication is going to build up in the RPE, in the choriocapillaris, and it's going to start to kill them off. So you literally get this salt and pepper fundus type of appearance where your RPE dies off and you have irreversible vision loss. So because of this and a lot of other systemic side effects, the medications are really not commonly used, but you will see them being used in especially inpatient treat treatment settings. Hey and Tammy, go back, go back to your uh, back. to your to your OCT there. You have to use the pointer. Go up to the uh, OCT there, and just in that uh -huh. core right, right there you are. You can see that the shadowing, the RPE, yep. is intact there. But if you go to the side and show the audience where it's all kind of 
those are called like hyper reflective columns. Mm -hmm. That is just, I just want to point out to the audience, that is yep. just terrible RPE dropout. In the, where the macula mm -hmm. is or where the fovea is there, you can see the shadowing. That coherent light is still absorbed there by the by the uh, foveal, I guess, RPE pigment. Mm -hmm. But just out there, pair up, pair E central, you can just see all that light going down. You can see all that atrophy. That's just a a, a good and a bad, I guess, uh, right. just terrible atrophy. So Right. I'm just going to turn the lights on. It's getting a lot darker than I thought. That's fine. Okay. There we go. All right. So our atypical antipsychotics, so this is like uh, the uh, clozapine that you might see in patients with schizophrenia, but also reducing um, suicidal thoughts in our patients with a high risk of um, potential suicide. These, we're not really sure exactly how they work, but they do work on both the dopamine and the serotonin receptors by increasing. And they also decrease the activity in your mesolimbic pathway, which is your reward pathway to decrease the amount of um, suicidal ideation, pretty much. This is one of those medications where you're going to start having uncontrolled muscle movements. So things like nystagmus, myokemia, bilateral myokemia, ocular motor dysfunction. So the patient can present with either a palsy or strabismus or diplopia, um, headaches and nausea. This is also one of the medications that has the anticholinergic effect. So everything that comes with cyclopelagia. So the anticholinergic part, as you can see, is very, very deeply embedded with all of our um, depression antipsychotic medications. Another atypical antipsychotic are our things like Risperidol, Abilify, Zyprexa. These are prescribed for, again, schizophrenia, but more so bipolar disorder, and very commonly for our autistic patients that show a lot of irritability. These, again, work on our dopamine and serotonin receptors. They don't have as much um, systemic side effects, so they're much more commonly used. But again, this is one of those that can cause uncontrolled muscle movements, so a lot of blinking ocular motor dysfunction, saccades, pursuit dysfunction, as well as a nystagmus. There's also going to be a decrease in lacrimation and the anticholinergic uh, effects in cycloplegia that we talked about. So you, again, you have all these slides. Um, this is a chart of all the um, antipsychotics that, that we discussed in a very quick view in terms of what their use, their mechanism, as well as their ocular side effects, just for, for your own use. And we're up for polling question number two. And we are launched. Diamox is the go-to initial treatment for elevated IOP due to a choroidal effusion. True or false? No other questions have really rolled in here. Everything's good. Joe sent the hand out. We're cruising along at 36,000 feet. All right. We'll end the poll. Looks like things have slowed down. And there's your results, Tammy. Okay, beautiful. So, um, yes, it is false. So, remember, with choroidal effusion... This is one of those where we want to cycloplege. We want to use a steroid to bring down the, um, the amount of effusion or leakage of fluid. We want to cycloplege to bring everything back, to bring that lens um, and ciliary body complex back to open up that, that angle. What we don't want to do is put them on a sulfa drug. So Diamox is a sulfa medication, which will then potentially worsen your choroidal effusion. So Diamox is one of those that we want to actually avoid. So that's why it's so very important that we take a look at the back of the AI before putting a patient on Diamox, because if their angle closure is due to a choroidal effusion, we want to try to avoid that medication because it could potentially make things worse. Yeah, it's okay. kind of thought of to be an allergy reaction, allergic reaction. So it's 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 an allergic reaction kind of specific to that ciliary body. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of echo what you just said there, Tammy, why would we give, you know, a, a, a sulfa like medication or a sulfa similar medication to that, that if it's an allergy and that's what's causing it. So kind of think of it as an allergy out there or that, you know, this is an adverse reaction. 
So an allergy rather than kind of the true angle closure thought process. Right. So just like if your lips swell up, if you eat something and you get all swollen, same thing happening just inside your eye. Yeah, a question came in, you know, what are you looking for in the posterior segment, edema? You're looking for the kissing cord. So when you look in the back, you will literally see um, the, the retina, but, but from the back, literally the choroid pushing forward. So this, this is the, um, the nerve right here, and you'll literally see the choroids coming out and, and almost touching, uh, called kissing choroids, where everything is literally pushing forward. And also in the anterior chamber, you're going to see that the, um, the chamber is extremely very, very, very shallow because everything is pushed, pushed forward. Even even kind of all the way towards central, it almost looks like angle mm-hmm. closure in the center part of the eye, yeah. rather than over at the side. So yeah, it's mm-hmm. kind of a it's it's kind of a, a unique type of presentation. Yep, it yep. really is. Yep. All right, moving on to our genital urinaries. So we're going to talk about our alpha one antagonists. These are used for benign prostate hypertrophy to improve urine outflow. The reason I put this in here is because most people think of BPH, benign prostate hypertrophy, um, for males, obviously. And so we are going to take the alpha one agonist. So where's my, the, the flow max. Um, specifically, the Flomax, um, we we consider, you know, being used for for males. But I do want to make a point that females do also use the the Flomax medication, and they use it to improve urinary retention. So you will have females on this medication. Don't be surprised if they say they're using Flomax. It's for urinary retention. This is a selective systemic alpha one antagonist. It works to relax smooth muscle, um, and really. What we care about is if we're sending the patient off for surgery, we need to very much let the surgeon know and ourselves for pre and post-op follow-ups know that the patient is on this because one of the smooth muscles that it's going to relax is the iris. And so what's going to start to happen is two things really. One is we can get floppy iris uh, syndrome One is where we do the incision, the iris is so very flimsy and floppy that it can literally perforate through the incision. And two, what actually happens is that when the patient gets dilated so that the surgeon can go in and do the capsulorexis and and break up um, the lens, mid-surgery, that iris will actually start to constrict. So the surgeon will frequently put iris hooks on to prevent that mid-surgical constriction. And also there are settings now that we have on the, um, the machinery for the cataract extraction to do uh, not as um, uh, a rough breakup of, of the, the cataract so that we can try to prevent intraoperative problems. So just cognizance and awareness for surgery. Yeah. So let me just, let mm -hmm. me just make a comment there, Tammy, that uh, I had a patient, you know, that the surgeons like to be identified when the patients are on these kind of flow max type of Mm -hmm. medications. The another reason being they could be on it maybe two or three years ago and be off of it, but the iris remains floppy. Right. And it does create a challenge out there for the for the surgeon to do surgery. And they have, like you said, as uh, long as they know, they might use a little bit more viscoelastic to try and, and ch- try and control that iris. You, like you said, they don't dilate as well, iris hooks. Um, I do a lot of post-op care. Mm-hmm. I get them day one and mm-hmm. uh, I've learned how to burp a paracentesis. So <laughs> if the pressure comes in 40 or 50, I just burp them, get them down to 10 or 20. Mm-hmm. You know, you find where the paracetesis is, you push on it with, yeah, I usually use jewelers, forceps, burp the, burp the wound. Um, well, yeah, mm-hmm. I did, I did it one time, just the paracetesis, don't do the, don't do the incision, but the paracentesis, yep, yep, so I yep. burped that. And, uh, you know, patient had, was on Flomax at one point and I had to call my surgeon up and said, you and you are by chance today, you want to put an iris <laughs> back in the, it didn't come all the way through, what are you like doing showed, today? but it was, but yeah. it was caught, it was caught in the wound. Um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, he, he did it gracefully, graciously for me and yeah. no, no big deal. And the patient was all fine, but, um, just but to yeah, echo those guys that are out there. Yeah, yeah. Just to echo those guys that are out there, ladies that are burping paracentesis. I, I check that now too. So. Right. 
right and again it could be in your female patients as well so so do double check that 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 would not i would be not not be happy with that in my chair but no um okay so the little blue pills or yellow pills that that we have the um phosphodiesterase inhibitors the viagra levitra the cialis these are used for erectile dysfunction um but originally they were actually meant for pulmonary hypertension but then we got this you know wonderful side effect that that people got, and so now it's used for mainly erectile dysfunction. Um, this works to prevent inactivation of the CAMP intracellular messengers, and from our perspective, as, as we know, it causes a psyopsia. So this is a blue haze that lasts for about one to four hours after administration, especially with the higher doses. And this happens because the drug itself blocks hyperpolarization of our photoreceptors. It blocks phototransduction. And so our color vision starts to be off and everything starts to be shadowed as blue for several hours. The NAION that we know of um, can happen due to a decrease in optic nerve head perfusion. Um, so we can get the, um, the APD, the visual field defects. We can start off with the MRSS Fugax that can last with, uh, several minutes to hours. But again, this is one of those things where we had about 11% of the patients on these little blue pills that got the NAIONs at a higher dose. But these patients were also all elderly, and they also had hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol. And these patients also had smaller optic nerve heads, smaller CDs. So that makes those patients already prone for NAION. So was it the medication? Was it a comorbidity? Was was it a side effect? Was it happenstance? We don't really know, but it's, you know, it's 11%. So it is something to be careful and cognizant of. The thing that we really should keep in the back of our minds as well with this medication is our retinitis pigmentosa patients. So some of our RP patients have a genetic disorder of retinal phototransductase, and that's what these medications work on. And so these medications do need to be avoided um, or be very closely taken in our patients with retinitis pigmentosa. You know, uh, uh, before you go on, Tammy, yeah. you know, people people ask me about uh, my my warning people who are you know men who are using the, uh, the little blue uh, pill, erectile, yeah, the erectile dysfunction pills, and I I don't I don't it, only about fifty some cases that have actually been reported. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's probably more that haven't been reported, but it's a very small number of a very small number. Right. So right. I don't, so, uh, so that's I don't, why I say really take it with a grain of salt because I'm exactly. not convinced with these results at all. But I, I might I might mention to them the uh, the phototransductase changes mm -hmm. and the blue pit the, and the blue tinges they may have. And I said, you know, like like the white shirt that I'm currently wearing might appear blue to somebody if, if they're having this uh, issue. Right. And and with with your <laughs> with your um pilots, right? Also, obviously, um, or anyone that needs to have good color vision for whatever job function they they have, you know, they should finish work uh before they they take this. Um, an over-the-counter genitourinary is going to be our histamine 2 blockers. So this is things like Zantac, which you get over-the-counter. You can take it as frequently as you want because, you know, it's over-the-counter. People take it for heartburn, and a lot of times they take way too much of it for heartburn. So this works to block histamine 2 receptors in your stomach to reduce production of acid in your stomach. But it's a histamine 2 blocker, so it does have anticholinergic, uh, cycloplegic properties. So so everything that we said about with our cycloplegics from photophobia to medriasis to uh, dry eye, cycloplegia and vision change is all true for this medication as well. And then with this medication, you can also start getting color vision changes as well as conjunctivitis. In terms of why exactly that happens, um, the mechanism for, I'm not really quite sure. I have looked and haven't been able to figure out but um, a potential side effect that's been reported is color vision changes and conjunctivitis um, for this as well. Moving right, on. Pause there. Yep. Pause there. Pausing. Go back. Pausing. Yep. This, this is the reason why, to the audience, this is the reason why patients call all the time saying, hey, I read the box and I shouldn't be taking this or can I take this because I have glaucoma, right? 
50 percent of my practice now or or 40 percent and whatever the number is a high percent of my practice is glaucoma and so i get these calls all the time right so these are your narrow angle people that have a potential of in a sense dilating and going into angle closure that's why that warning is on the box so anyone that's had cataract surgery anyone that's wide open anyone it's glaucoma primary open angle glaucoma you know i get the calls all the time but this is it right here this is why that warning is on the box just fyi right, right. and again it's for those narrow angles so the, the majority of your you know open angle glaucomas they they might get madriasis but they're not necessarily going to have a large spike in their iop so they're okay to take these kinds of medications you know if if they don't they don't have narrow angles but again you do need to differentiate for your patients all right hormone replacement so this is our synthroid this is our levothyroid these are taken for our patients with hyperthyroidism and this replaces the thyroxine that should be naturally produced by your thyroid but it's not so you have hyperthyroidism um, and this is going to replace that in terms of our ocular side effects, this is one of those medications that can cause pseudotumor cerebri, um, which is a increase in the intracranial pressure inside of the brain. Um, and we have an increase in intracranial pressure, which then causes squeezing and pushing on the brain, um, as well as on the optic nerve head. And so these patients are going to have headaches. They're going to have ringing in the ears, nausea. They can have uh, diplopia. We can get a bilateral or a unilateral um, six nerve palsy with these patients, as well as when you take a look at the nerve, they're going to have optic nerve edema, visual field defects, and APD um, when you're doing their pupils. So let me see, I had a picture. Yep, there we go. So where we have an increase in our um, cerebrospinal fluid levels because there's too much cerebrospinal fluid being produced um, and it doesn't get drained out fast enough, we start to get edema pretty much everywhere, including the optic nerve. These patients, because of the, um, the thyroxine, can also start to exhibit mycenia-like symptoms because we have too much hormone floating around in our system potentially. So mycenia-like symptoms being diplopia, ptosis, as well as a palsy or paresis of EOMs and diplopia. So this is one of those where you want to monitor these patients closely, let them know that these are potential side effects and to come in right away if they are ex uh, experiencing any of them. Um, just a, a quick uh, reminder, when you send a patient over um, to the emergency room with swollen nerves, we're suspecting um, pseudotumor cerebri or increase in intracranial pressure, the patients are always going to first get an MRI before they do a lumbar, puncture, a lumbar puncture to see if in fact they have increased intracranial pressure. This is done because you can get increasing intracranial pressure from a tumor in the brain. So if there's a tumor in the brain and you do a lumbar puncture and you drain out some of your cerebral spinal fluid, what that can do is it can actually spread the tumor throughout the nervous system. So they will usually always run an MRI first, make sure there's no tumor happening to be causing the symptoms, um, to be causing the in increased intracranial pressure, and then they'll do the lumbar puncture to confirm that the intracranial pressure is elevated. No, we're good? All right, I'm moving on. Um, mm -hmm. Diabetes, um, this is, why am I? Okay. So another endocrine medication is uh, thiazolindothiodone. That's a, that's a mouthful. So Actos or Avandia. These are very common medications that we're seeing our diabetic patients take nowadays. Um, and this increases the patient's sensitivity to insulin that they might be taking. And this is one of those medications where the medication itself, the Actos, can cause um, macular edema. It can cause blurriness in vision, wavy vision, uh, central visual field defects, decrease in contrast because of the macular edema. So the disease itself, the 
diabetes can cause macular edema, but the medication for that disease can also cause macular edema. So this is one of those medications where we're not sure if we're having a side effect to the medication, or this is actually because the diabetes is poorly controlled and we're having a side effect to the systemic disease. So this is one of those to keep in the back of your mind with your diabetic patients and, and really try to field out and see if there is other, I know you can have macular diabetic um, edema without any kind of hemorrhaging, but you want to take everything into consideration to see if this is more of a medication side effect or systemic disease effect. Our contraceptives, um, also another endocrine agent. So this is anything with progesterone or estrogen inside of it. And this is taken for everything and anything, really. You can have um, a female that's younger than a teenager taking these medications um, to help control their menstrual cycle. You can have geriatric patients taking this to um, also control, control their cycle. So pretty much once we pass about seven, eight years old, a female of any age, it's not just childbearing age, of any age could potentially be on this medication. So it really does behoove us because of the vast amount of ocular side effects it can potentially have to when we're asking for medication use to really all of our female patients ask specifically for contraceptive use. Because again, they might not be taking it as a contraceptive, they might be taking it for other reasons. Um, and the way these works is they increase systemic hormone. They also produce a change in our vasculature. They produce an enhancement in platelet adhesiveness. They increase fibrinogen as well as clotting factor. And so because of this um, pretty much medication-induced hypercoagulable state that the patient is in, we can start having a lot of side effects, anywhere from a retinal thrombosis to optic neuritis, transient ischemic attacks. Um, this medication, because of the, the hormone changes, can also cause an increase in intracranial pressure, pseudotumor cerebri. We can also have dry eye contact lens intolerance because we have a decrease in tear secretion, headaches, macular edema because of the swelling. So really a lot of potential side effects um, for these medications. So again, I will usually ask even my, any, from pediatric to geriatric female patients if they're specifically on contraceptives. Now, before you, before you go on, uh, Tammy, because you're still talking about a little bit of pseudotumor, a comment mm -hmm. came out in, from a, an attendee who had a 17-year-old headaches and bilateral papilledema one, one time. Mm -hmm. uh, clear, just too much CSF, but very scary looking. I think mm -hmm. what I want to I point out is uh, pseudotumor and glaucoma are very similar. In fact, they, they're treated with a glaucoma, both treated with a glaucoma medicines, Diamox, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that, as Greg, as Greg points out, it's very rarely is glaucoma an overproduction of aqueous. It's an under drainage. Mm -hmm. The same thing mm -hmm. for pseudotumor. These, these other things, such as tetracyclines uh, and a number of other, another uh, vitamin A, prevents the arachnoid villi from uh, from uh, draining the draining. CSF. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very analogous to glaucoma. In fact, mm -hmm. I, I, I refer to it as glaucoma of the brain. Yeah, it, it is. I, I agree. It is very, very innocuous. A lot of a lot of similar mechanisms and, and treatments. Um, yeah, but it is very, very scary. I've, I've seen several pediatric patients um, with the swollen nerves. Um, and especially, you know, in, in any patient, it's scary. But especially if you see it in a pediatric patient, it's, it's terrifying. It really is. Mm -hmm. And and with the parents as well, you know, um, telling them, hey, you got to sketch over to the emergency room. That That's a, a scary conversation to have, definitely. But an important and, one. And the, and the person just came back with, if I remember correctly, doxycycline or minocycline. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. great, you know, Greg has a, a great talk and a great case on this. Yeah, that was that was what we call a secondary pseudotumor. It's not IIH. Mm -hmm. That's sec right. Sharon. That's a secondary pseudotumor. Right. Just like we have secondary glaucomas, right? The glaucomas mm -hmm. due to something else, either medication or trauma or something going on systemically. Same same thing. A secondary pseudotumor. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to our chemotherapeutics. So these are the anti-estrogen, yeah, the tamoxifen. Um, 
these are anti-estrogen medications that are prescribed for non-steroidal anti-estrogen that's used for metastatic breast cancer, as well as ovarian carcinomas, as well as as a preventative measure in our high-risk cancer patients. These have a selective modulation and occupation of estrogen receptors throughout the body. And this is one of those medications that can give you that whirl-like keratopathy, the tamoxifen. These will also cause a very central and dense posterior subcapsular cataract up to 40% after taking the medication for five years. We'll have that dense central uh, subcapsular cataracts right in the middle of the visual axis. And this type of cataract will actually progress even after the medication is, the tamoxifen is discontinued. So these patients will require cataract extraction um, relatively earlier on than they normally would. The tamoxifen is another one of those, so 0.5% um, where we can get crystalline retinopathy. So very rare to happen, but it can. This is where we have the refractile crystals. These are products of external damage or uh, degeneration, degradation from the medication that start to accumulate in the nerve fiber and the plexiform retinal layers. And they're going to cluster mainly around the macula and can cause very decreased, very, um, very severe decreased vision loss in very severe cases, but much more commonly to cause things like macular edema. So you can see these crystalline bodies, where's my thingy, um, crystalline bodies sitting right over here, and you can see them on the OCT sitting right in the middle of the retinal layers. So this can potentially, if you have enough accumulation, cause um, both macular edema as well as uh, damage to the retina and vision loss, but very, very rare to happen. Another Karen, acute, acute I'm yeah. sorry, Karen, a real quick question comes in. Yep. Can 5-FU or oxaliplatin cause ocular problems? Say that, say that one more time. Can 5-FU or oxaliplatin cause oxaliplatin. ocular problems? Um. I will have to look that up off the top of my head. I can't give okay, you no, a specific. No yeah. I, I, but I, I, can we write that know. down? Yeah, I don't, let's I write that down either. and I'll look it up. Yeah, there's there's so many of these medications, but honestly, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna say just off the top of my head, sure, yes, because a lot of the systemic medications do. But I'm gonna write the medication down, or one of you guys write it down. I will look it up and I will get back to you on that. Yeah, my, my answer would be yes, some way, you know, my standard is the immune system doesn't like to be tinkered with. And you said it early in the discussion, Tammy, you know, pharmacogenetics, you know, the, the, these are all receptors and certain people have certain receptors different than other people. That's the pharmacogenetics that's getting exciting now that's coming. So there's probably someone out there that has taken those medications and had an ocular side effect. Now, is it common? Probably the answer is no, but it's just all going to be due to receptors in the immune system being, um, um, you know, being tinkered with. So in the, yeah. in the, in the attendee put, you know, the, uh, ruined, uh, ruined his liver. So, uh, mm. yeah, so that's just, you know, I would, I would say yeah. it causes blurred vision because everything does. Everything causes blurred vision. It really does. Actually, actually I, deal, I deal, with that, deal with that a lot. And what I've noticed is everything, every medicine out there causes, it has a warning that causes blurred vision, except for the medicines that actually cause blurred vision. They don't have that warning. <laughs> right. <laughs> But yeah, it says it says blurred vision, and then you have to go and dig through and figure out what what the heck that blurred vision is due to. Yeah, but yeah. Um, okay, our next one is going to be the methotrexate. So I'm sure you guys have learned about this in school. It's an anti-metabolite that is prescribed for cancers, um, for blood, bone, lung, breast, neck cancer, um, but also prescribed for our rheumatic patients and our psoriatic patients. This is going to competitively inhibit binding sites of certain receptors, pretty much. So. Um, what it does is it, um, it's an anti-metabolite that um, helps prevent bonding 
to certain receptors. And this is one of those that cause can potentially cause a lot of inflammation. So we can get inflammation in the eye from rheumatoid arthritis, from psoriasis, but this is one of those medications that can also cause a lot of inflammation. So we're going to have pain in the eye, photophobia, blurred vision, increase in IOP. This can also cause dry and irritated eyes, as well as potentially in a small amount of patients, um, NAIONs as well. So potentially a reversible vision loss. Poll number three. Antidepressants and antipsychotics very rarely cause cycloplegia and dry eye. True or false? It looks like we're all caught up with the... Uh, Questions? Questions. Joe, you launched it the last time. Do you mind putting the uh, handout back in there one more time? No, no worries. I'll be happy to do that. One, one thing that I've learned, uh, it, it, not just this topic, but I get a lot of neuro-op nonsense in my practice. Two things that come together, dilated pupils and blurred vision is a toxicity of some sort. Mm -hmm. You just got to figure out what it is. But whenever you, whenever your patient with blurred vision, dilated pupils always take some sort of toxic reaction, right. and it may not it may not be medicine. I, I I had a I had a patient get that along with double vision and nystagmus uh, from from drinking a couple of liters of diet Dr Pepper. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Is there a reason? Yeah. Is there like a, a background to why? Why it happens? Why he did it? Well, well. <laughs> the, the what's in that was, Dr. Pepper? The reason was he and his wife drove from Connecticut down to Florida nonstop. And 7-Eleven was having a special on Big Gulp. If you bought it, you got free refills. Uh, so the only reason okay. they stopped was to use the bathroom, get gas, and get, get uh, Diet Dr. Pe Pepper Big Gulp. Big Gulp. Well, so that, that's a I, lot more bathroom stops. Yeah. They're better off so, using the five-hour energy little bottles. So why the mechanics? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I just knew that was a cause. Yeah. I said uh, his, his imaging was all normal. I said, look, I'm gonna see you in a week. If you're if you're better, cancel the appointment. If you're not better, come back. Three days later, said, I'm better. I'm canceling. Uh, Sounds yeah. great. That happens frequently. It could mm -hmm. have also been that he had to sit in the car with his wife on the drive down. Mm -hmm. That could have potentially been the cause. And Rich, and Rich is a diet, Dr. Pepper, Mountain Dew, or poison, sickly water, and sweet iced tea. Yeah, there's there's a, there's a lot of uh, wisdom in that. Yes, yes. And, and, whatever, and whatever a patient tells you they ingest, triple it. Oh, yes, yes, very true. Very true. I had I had it. I had a dilated pupil the other day in blurred vision, Joe. It was toxic related in a sense, but it was from a pickleball that hit the guy's eye. He had a high fever. So. <laughs> yeah, pickleball is picking up and, and it's it's not good. No one's wearing those protective goggles and it's the perfect size to really get get in there and cause a lot of trauma. So for our neurologics, these are things like the gabapentin, Depcote. These are medications that are prescribed for patients with bipolar disorder, um, acute depression. So these can correlate with our antipsychotics as well, but the main purpose for our neurologic agents is for patients with seizure and post-herpatic neuralgia. So these are also medications that are going to increase the amount of GABA. So if you remember, GABA is going to bring everything down. All neuronal firing is going to come down when we take a GABA analog. So if we have much slower neuronal firing, then we can get things like diplopia, saccade pursuit dysfunction, nystagmus, myokemia. And then these are the medications that can also cause some edema to the macula, um, but they can also cause optic neuritis and visual field defects. Um, again, mechanism not fully known for the edema or the optic neuritis, but it is listed as one of the potential potential side effects for our GABA analogs. Let me take a little throw in here because I forget the PADUFA date, but it's going to be August something to look it up, but it's August. Uh, Tarsus with TPO3 is coming out with a medication uh, to treat Demodex. Mm. 
and it's targeting, and this is the second time that you taught about, brought this up, mm -hmm. how gamma or the GABA inhibitors stop firing, neurologic, blah, 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 blah. That's mm -hmm. exactly what this medication is going to target. It's going to be a twice a day, six week treatment for Demodex. But the good news is it's the, it's the GABA uh, channel that is not found in the human. It's only found in the parasite. So it's going to have zero effect on the human. Okay. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So when that medication comes out, there's no confusion that's out there. It's only found in the parasites. So okay, FYI. good to know. Go. Well, so so pharmacogenetics, right? We don't we don't yeah. have the 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 proper receptor for that. So good, that's good to know. I'll have to keep my eye out out eye out for that for Demodex. Interesting. Um, Topamax Topiramate is an anticonvulsant that is prescribed for patients with seizures, with epilepsy, but it is frequently prescribed for patients off-label for migraines, and it's also prescribed off-label for patients with bipolar or mood disorder. So a lot of our neurologic agents are also used off-label as antipsychotics. Um, and it's also prescribed for a lot of patients um, as a weight loss medication. This is another one of those where it inadvertently, through a different pathway, but inadvertently also enhances GABA. So it really inhibits all neurotransmission. So if we're inhibiting neurotransmission, we're getting the pursued problems, the saccade problems, we're getting the myokemia, we are getting diplopia, potentially strabismus. And then this is one of those uh, medications that can, again, also cause visual field defects, but cataracts in these patients. And Surprisingly, with some of these patients, you can have a little bit of a refractive shift. Um, we're talking maybe half a diopter to a diopter. So if you have a patient that um, is having a lot of refractive shifts, um, then they they might be on the medication. But this is another, another one of those that can cause choroidal effusion. So somebody was asking me about the kissing choroids. So this is what the kissing choroids look like. You look at the back of the eye, the patient's already dilated, so you can get a really good, nice look in. You have the nerve here, and then you literally have your choroid coming and pushing over from, from all different sides, the kissing choroids. Um, and again, remember, no diamox, um, no pylo. We do want to dilate. We want a steroid, um, cycloplege, and, and drop the IOP. I love Winnie the Pooh, and apparently everybody there has some kind of a neurologic or psychotic disorder. So I just found this very cute, um, just for, for your own fun. Moving on to our osteoporosis agents, we are going to talk about... Hold on, before, before we, draw, we go, before we go. Question comes in, 46-year-old, somebody had a 46-year-old patient today on Topiramate. Complaining of dim vision, walks in the room, feels light should be brighter. 2020 HI could be related to Topamax. Is there only med? Uh, mm -hmm. Patient's Plano. My, my, my belief here is, I would ask, did this happen at the same time that you began the Topamate? Right. If the answer or within the, yes, within the first, like, weeks or months, yeah. No, I would say first week certainly, mm -hmm. and I would, I would, I would, uh, I would consider it if there is a spatial pro uh, uh, temporal uh, temporal proximity. But otherwise, I wouldn't blame it for that. No, not necessarily. Again, it, it might make cataracts progress a little bit faster. Um, so maybe you know they're feeling like they're you know they're contrast is down because of the cataracts and it might be progressing faster. But yeah, I agree. I wouldn't, if the timeline doesn't fit, then I wouldn't um, blame it on the medication. And, and just to add to Joe, just make sure they haven't changed anything to their diets. Are they taking it with some wine now? And they're not considering that to be a medication. You mm -hmm. know, they start doing some different things. Find out, you know, exactly like Joe said, timing and find out like how they're taking it or if there's been any changes in their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Or any other new medications that they might be taking. Well, you said they're not taking any other medications. But over-the-counters, a lot of people don't consider over-the-counters as medication. So. You're, and uh, the attendee said, thanks, and uh, you're welcome. That's what we're here for. Of course. All right. Bone disease. Um, bisphosphonate. So this is the Benivia, the Fosamax um, that we see commercials for all over the place taken by um, about 55 million Americans. 
uh, men and postmenopausal women are using this to prevent calcium bone loss or osteoporosis, um, for hypercalcemia, for bone metastasis, as well as in Piaget's disease. The way this works is it binds to the surface of the bones and it slows down the bone eroding cells, the osteoclasts. And so it allows the osteoblasts, the one that um, build up our bones, to work more efficiently without being uh, the bone tissue being destroyed. Ocular side effects do have a low incidence, but within, again, within the first couple of weeks of taking the medication, they can start to um, have ocular inflammation anywhere, and, and more so um, in the front of the eye, so a conjunctivitis, a uveitis, much more rare to have an episcleritis or a scleritis, but they do have some conjunctival irritation, some dryness. Again, we talked about um, a little bit of irritation and hyperemia, but more so a low-key kind of a, an inflammation that happens in the front segment of the eye with our bisphosphonates. Rheumatologically, uh, the quinolones are prescribed for rheumatoid arthritis and for lupus, as well as other collagen diseases and for malaria. And the quinolones decrease the stimulation of, as well as communication between our immune cell complexes. We still don't know exactly how they work, but um, that's the theory there. Whirl like keratopathy for our quinolones, um, as we talked about, some reduction in corneal sensation in about half of the patients that are taking it. There is some decrease in accommodation, so the patient might be complaining of near vision blur, need an ad sooner rather than later. And they can also get this white flaky posterior subcapsular cataracts that might require cataract extraction uh, sooner rather than later. But the thing that we all, you know, the rheumatologist will send the patient over for is the bullseye maculopathy. So the drug itself is going to bind to the melanin in the retina. You're going to get degenerative changes and pigment clumping of the RPE. And so dose dependent, but you're going to start getting irreversible retinal damage if you are on a high dose for a long period of time. So eventually you're going to end up with metamorphopsia, vision blur, paracentral or central visual field loss, as well as RPE loss on the OCT. So in our sense, we really wanna catch this before those macular changes start to happen. So again, we talked about both um, dose as well as uh, period of time, duration of time that they've been taking it. So uh, lower dose, long, lower amount of time, much less risk of toxicity. And the higher the dose goes, the longer period of time you're taking the medication, the higher the toxicity is. In terms of major risk factors for developing toxic retinopathy with your Plaquenils, um, taking it for more than five years, having a higher dose, um, if the patient has a renal disease, if they are taking tamoxifen as well as um, the Plaquenil, or if they have macular disease. So macular disease doesn't actually cause a comorbidity necessarily, but if the patient has macular disease, it might be very difficult for us to pick up on small minute changes that might be happening in the macula. And so those patients do want to be screened um, much more frequently, maybe yearly, instead of every five years. So the way it is now is if the patient just started taking the medication or they're just starting to take the medication at a lower dose, they don't have uh, renal disease, they are not taking uh, any concomitant drugs that can cause macular pathology, then if everything is normal and fine, then we can see them in five years after they've been exposed to the medications and then yearly after that. I don't necessarily um, follow that five-year rule. I might do one year, two years, depending depending on um, what's going on with the patient. But the standard nowadays is do the check if everything is good and fine, then you can re-image in five years. In terms of how we do the clinical examination, what are you doing and imaging? So at this point, doing just a regular fundus examination, doing photos, doing an Amsler grid, color vision testing, none of those are good enough at this point. We have much more sensitive and specific tests that we can do to pick up very early maculopathy. So uh, SDOCT, 
of the macula, as well as a visual field. So if a patient is of an Asian descent, then they have more paracentral defects that can start to form. And so we're going to run a wider 30-2 for those patients. And for our non-Asian patients, then we have more of a central macular defect that can start to form. And those patients, we're going to run a 10-2. Now we have something called the 24-2C, which is a 24-2 with 10 extra central points. So that is also possibly um, a modality that you might want to run on all your patients because you get the paracentral, but you get the central as well to make sure that you're not missing any defects. You know, Tam Tammy, what, what you just said is spot on in terms of uh, surveillance. But my experience is the primary care physicians who, uh, and, and rheumatologists who have them on this medicine, they, they, they want it done every year. Yeah, they, yeah. They just feel better. Right, right, exactly. It's, it's, you know, it's yes, that those are the, those are the rules and regulations that have come out, but five years is really a long time. I, I was for, for Sophie, my, my fourth, I was actually put on Plaquenil. And I was like, what? No, Plaquenil, it's apparently a really common medication for pregnant females to be put on. Well, obviously pregnant females. Um, but yeah, for pregnant, pregnant women to be put on. And, um, I was like, screen me, do this, do that. And my, my OB was very adamant, make sure you go, make sure you get checked. You're an eye doctor, so you're going to be horrible at it. I want a note from your doctor telling me that you've done the testing. Um, and, and he was very adamant about it being done. Um, and I was on it for a short period of time, but they, they are good at making sure that it gets tested. Yeah, I'm going to say the same thing, uh, maybe just a different way. Um, from the literature, you said it perfectly, You what the literature has said. Now, I work right down the road. I, that's where I do all these investigational studies. I do their follow-ups. It's a, a six-man woman rheumatology practice. And we just talked about pharmacogenetics. And um, I would recommend checking yearly. I have mm -hmm. seen things as far as 18 months out in that perfectly healthy, no medication, blah, 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 kidneys, liver, so on and so forth, type of toxicity that's out there. So I would, you know, even though that's what the literature says and you echoed what the literature says beautifully, I would probably do um, a yearly. The mm -hmm. other thing that I would say is that there's a new color vision test out called the Raven Cone Contrast. That is a nice, uh, probably early, when you said color vision test is insensitive, mm -hmm. your standard Ishiharas and D15s, but this test yes. is, would pick it up pretty early, so. Yes, it is, and and I had I had a chance to um, to actually use it when we were in Pittsburgh, um, yeah. and it's 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 a great it's a great um, very very specific color vision test, and um, as you can see and we'll have this in the closings, but as you can see, a lot of these um, ocular vision side effects do have potential color vision changes as a side effect. So I have now started, we do color vision on all our pediatric patients, obviously, but I have now actually started having my residents do color vision on all of our adult patients as well, just as a baseline, because you have a lot of systemic medications that will cause color vision changes. So, you know, something to think about in terms of maybe a really quick additional test to add into your battery um, for your older adult geriatric population. Our immunomodulating agents, so these are the signal proteins, specifically interferon or, or pegasus, these are used for our hepatitis patients. Hepatitis C is the leading cause of liver disease in the US. These work to modulate the activity of the immune system as well as inhibit cell proliferation and also has some antiviral effects. So the interferon um, does for our hepatitis patients gets injected through a series of, of several months and it really causes very severe hypoxia. So all of the side effects pretty much that we are gonna get with the um, interferon is going to be pretty much hypoxic in nature. So we can have dryness, we can have conjunctivitis, blurry vision, cataracts, a decrease in color vision probably due to the optic neuritis. So a lot of times they'll kind of list potential side effects, but 
um, I'm assuming that the decrease in color vision is due to the optic neuritis. Um, and you can also get retinal um, artery as well as vein occlusions. And the classic kind of interferon retinopathy that we might see in a patient that is going through currently an interferon therapy um, will really happen due to the hypoxia that happens in the body and the eye due to the interferon. So this can happen anywhere from two to 15 weeks after the treatment. And again, the treatment does last several months. You're going to see cotton wool spots, retinal hemorrhages, the stored macular edema, and the patient might be totally asymptomatic um, unless they have the macular edema or hemorrhage in, in their macular area. Um, but important for us to evaluate for um, this but it does usually once the once the interferon treatment is done and finished, if they do have hypoxia in the eye, it will usually resolve after about three months once the treatment is discontinued. So poll question number four. It is launched and it says in Plaquenil use comma a 24-2 versus 10-2 visual field indicating indicated when evaluating an Asian patient, true or false? So 30-2 visual field is indicated when evaluating an Asian patient, true or false? And looks like we got a nice okay. So um remember that with plaquenil retinopathy, um classically we were always taught that the very central foveal area is going to start getting um, RPE loss, loss of the um, outer segment, inner segment um, area, and uh, the, the maculopathy. But there are studies that have been done that are now showing that with a Asian population specifically, their defects are not as much centrally and foveally, but para foveally, paramacularly. So for those patients, we want to run a much wider 30-2 field. And that's why that 24-2C, where you have a 24-2 with 10 extra central points, um, might look a little bit more enticing for the general um, evaluation because you do get those peripheral points as well as those central points as well, all in one. All righty. Okay, so um, moving on to our anti-inflammatories. So these are both steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, our corticosteroids. Um, these are prescribed for anything pretty much that causes inflammation from um, lupus to allergies to rheumatoid arthritis. And this controls the synthesis of the proteins that are going to regulate all aspects of inflammation. Remember our NSAIDs only control one branch or one arm of inflammation. The corticosteroids are going to control protein synthesis that regulates all aspects of inflammation. Um, and our corticosteroids, as we know, if a patient um, has herpetic keratitis, our, our corticosteroids can exacerbate it. They can also, it's one of those that can cause pseudotumor cerebri or papilledema. They do cause cataracts, specifically posterior subnuclear ones, um, dense ones. And they can also elevate our IOP as well as cause central serous macular um, edema and, and detachment. The NSAIDs, so these are over-the-counters, right? So our ibuprofen, we have the high dose that our prescription, but our regular ibuprofen, if a patient takes enough of them, they can really cause a lot of damage. Um, so these are taken anywhere from just swelling to arthritis for pain, and people will usually take these as they see fit. And a lot of times they're not thinking about how much they've actually taken. This will only inhibit the the Cox prostaglandin uh, synthesis. So we're not going to go go through this, but remember the corticosteroids cut off all inflammation. The NSAIDs just cut cut off just the Cox arm, um, and this is really dangerous because your NSAIDs, so your ibuprofen, especially in high dose taken for a long period of time, is one of those that can cause pseudotumor cerebri. So you can have a patient inadvertently cause potentially vision threatening, potentially life threatening side effects to themselves from just taking this analgesic for, you know, their pain in their knee. 
Um, these will also cause the world keratopathy as well as dry eye, and they can cause changes in color vision as well. The um, antibiotics or anti-infective, so our cyclines, the doxycycline, tetracycline, minocycline, these are prescribed for any and all potential um, infections, both local and generalized. It's a bactericidal, so it's going to kill the bacteria off as well. It will inhibit protein synthesis, and it also suppresses uh, sebaceous gland activity, and it can actually kill off sebaceous glands as well. But because it's suppressing sebaceous gland activity, we can have it being used for things like acne, for example. Um, so you can start getting permanent atrophy of the meibomian glands. So, you know, dry eye years down the line after taking maybe a long course of cyclines. These are also another one that can cause pseudotumor cerebri. So if you have a patient that has recently started a cycling and they're having severe headaches, changes in their vision, nausea. You know that, um, uh, Sarah. Got him. Oh, okay. Um, another, so we talked about the sulfa drugs, right? So um, the Bactrim, the Septra, these are ones that the emergency room loves to give out. Um, and these can be used anywhere from rosacea to dandruff to any kind of an infection. These are going to be bacteriostatic, so they don't actually... Um, they inhibit the, the folate synthesis, they disrupt bacterial cell division, so they don't kill the bacteria, but they prevent it from replicating. And this is one of those that can cause a very severe allergic reaction called Steven Johnson, where you have an allergy to the sulfa medication and your immune system literally starts to eat away at your mucus glands in your mouth, in your nose, in your eyes. And these patients, unfortunately, if they get Steven Johnson, can um, progress to the point where their dry eye is so very severe that they get scarring of their cornea and might need a transplant. So we do want to be a little bit more careful with our um, sulfamides. And again, the sulfa medication itself can cause the choroidal effusion that we talked about before. So that's why we don't give diamox or sulfa medications um, during a choroidal effusion. Our anti-mycobacterials, uh, these are used for TB. Um, I just want to mention this because we don't obviously see these very often, but this is one of those that can cause optic nerve toxicity, cause irreversible vision loss. So if you have patients that are maybe traveling into the country, might be on an anti-mycobacterial and have sudden vision loss, um, then it could possibly be from the optic nerve toxicity. Now, Tammy, I, I just had a patient this week uh, mm -hmm. um, at that mm -hmm. Uh probably about five weeks in, and it, how long he'll be on it for MAC is unknown, but I twigged off and said, look, you're going to come back, we're going to do visual fields, photography, mm -hmm. and, uh, retinal, and uh, retinal nerve fiber layer OCT, mm -hmm. and we're going to do it. We're going to do it every month here on the med. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because they, they need the medication, right? So mm -hmm. you just want to monitor them very, very closely. And as soon as um, you see, you know, a, a shift, a change or a progression, then you can kind of bite the bullet. But I'm sure you're, you're talking to the prescribing doc pro probably as well. I'm not just monitoring necessary. right now. If uh, necessary, yeah. I will, because I don't want to tell right. that person to stop the medicine right. because I have no... I have no reason to stop it yet, but right now, a a prime cause of medical malpractice is failure to recognize this as a possibility. Right, right, exactly. Hey, hey Tammy, before you move on, and I just mm -hmm. want to clarify this because this is something that I talk about when I talk with my pharmacist, mm -hmm. uh, Tracy Ofter Adal, is that you mm -hmm. just talked about you know your Bactrim type of medications. Mm -hmm people being allergic to them when mm -hmm. they i just want the audience to realize if they're allergic to bactrim how many times have we given a patient diamox or true soft or co soft and they haven't had an allergic reaction and i want the audience to realize that if they're allergic to them and it gets complicated so when it take 30 seconds here is that if they're allergic to the antibiotic it's not because they're allergic to the sulfa. 
the sulfa is not the haptin, the allergen. It's something called the amine, uh, aerial amine. It's part of the back the the bactrim and all the antibiotics it's not the sulfa that's why if someone's allergic to sulfa and we've given them diamox and we've given them true soft or we've given them uh cosop they don't have the reaction because those medications don't have that n aerial amine group on i think that's what it is a r y l amine i think that's what it is it's that's the allergic part in the antibiotic so that's why sometimes you know you're like hey you're allergic to sulfa but i gave you true soft mm -hmm. that's the reason why is because it doesn't have that other haptin part of it so don't want to turn into a long but in case the audience is out there has ever had that happen to them mm -hmm. yeah no that's a that's a great point it is so we only have a couple of minutes left, and I really want to spend the last couple of minutes just going through some very common over-the-counter medications. So for example, the anti-allergy medications like the Zyrtec and the Allegra. So these are the ones that um, you know our patients are going to be using all throughout the season, both in, in the spring, in the summer, in the fall, and in the winter time. And these are Antihistamines, so they're going to have anticholinergic properties. So we talk about the pedriasis, the dry eye, uh, you know, sudden contact lens intolerance, the cycloplegia, the change in near vision specifically. It could just be from those um, over-the-counter medications that they're taking. Sudafed, another one where you are going to get medriasis, but not cycloplegia, because this is one where you're increasing the sympathetics. You're, it's not an anticholinergic, so you are going to have the medriasis, you're going to have the dry eye. So these patients could be coming in, just taking over-the-counters, giving them um, these ocular side effects. And then the herbal medication. So I know not necessarily maybe down in Florida, but I know up here in the Northeast, ginkgo is huge. Um, you pretty much have all your elderly patients on ginkgo biloba. Um, it's very hard to really figure out what exactly is going on in this, you know, wonderful medication that a lot of people are taking for dementia. For some reason, they have it in their, uh, it's been publicized as wonderful for dementia. But what this medication really does is it's a blood vessel dilator. And it also inhibits activation of your platelets. So you can have a patient coming in that's not on a blood thinner of any kind. They're not taking aspirin, baby aspirin, and they're having hemorrhaging and they haven't had any real trauma. You're trying to figure out where these retinal hemes are coming from, why they got a subconjunctival heme just from rubbing their eye. And it could possibly just be their herbal ginkgo that they're taking to help with their memory and um, well-being. There are other medications such as high-dose vitamin B um, that can be given for patients with high cholesterol or just as a vitamin or a supplement. And these are um, potentially, they can cause macular edema. They can also cause edema to the eyelid. So you can start getting atosis to the eye as well as dry eye. Uh, dry eye. Vitamin A, uh, we already mentioned, we can get, you know, you can take vitamin A. And if you're buying your vitamins online, a lot of patients don't know what the actual recommended dosage is. Is, and you can get a very one pill that gives you a very, very high dose. So uh, the dose for, say, females is 700. And you can get a pill that's 10,000 in just one pill. So it's very easy, especially for these uh, lipid soluble vitamins that stay in the system and don't come out when you pee to really accumulate in, in your body and cause very, very serious side effects, such as with vitamin A, um, pseudotumor cerebri, so vision and potentially life-threatening. We can have um, patients, especially teenagers, on acne medications such as Accutane, um, that is, which is a vitamin A um, mo modality in a way that suppresses um, sebaceous gland activity. So it's given for acne, but it can cause very, very serious atrophy to your meibomian glands and so lifelong dry eye potentially, but also another one that can cause pseudotumor cerebri. So you know, just to just to take a look and see that over the counter medications are also very, very important to discuss with your patients. And if there's something that's not making sense in their medical history, um, just go back and re question about medications and especially about over the counters. So I believe we are all set. This is our last poll, number five, and then we can go to a uh, question and answer.
Yeah, so one comment I'll make, since you talked about the antihistamines, if someone wants a quick acronym, Z-A-C, ZAC, mm -hmm. Zyrtec is the strongest, Allegra is weaker in Claritin, or you can go the other way, um, C-A-Z, uh, Claritin Clear, just remember that's weak, is the weakest because of the Claritin Clear, then your Allegra, then your Zyrtec, and then if you want to more know where Zizel fits in, it fits in. So if you're trying to titrate people up, go Claritin, Allegra, and Zyrtec slash Zizel. That's it. And then the other comment I'll make is, you know, the reason why you see a lot of these vitamin supplements, what I call isolates, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E at such high dose, because there's no synergism. Um, you don't have the other antioxidants there to help out. So to get the effect, you have to give them at a high dose. At a high dose, you get the ocular or you get the complications. So that would be my two cents. All right, I'll stop sharing. All right. So we are, I stopped sharing because I believe we're done. It was a, a whole, whole bunch of information. So yes, um, what was the question? Over-the-counter medications, it's false, do very frequently cause ocular and visual adverse reactions. Um, and, and really, if you think about it, the medications we went over, um, these are medications that anywhere from the pediatric to geriatric population, most of your patients, unless they say, I take zero medications, absolutely nothing in my body, something that we discussed today um, is pertinent to most of your patients. So, and all of them that we discussed have an ocular or visual side effect. It might be very minute and really not causing any problems whatsoever, um, but it's also patient specific, right? Some patients have a very high pain tolerance, some patients have a very low pain tolerance. So they, you know, might be um, differently affected. Yep. The only thing that came in from the chat box is excellent lecture. Please come back and do more. And then Patty asked, uh, can you please repeat the name of the Demodex? Right now, the Investor game, I know it name, I know it as TPO3. Off the top of my head, it's like Lantelier, something like that. Lanta, Lanta something. Uh, just look up TPO3 and Tarsus. Um, and I think the Padufa date. Uh, is like August, like say 25th, but that's just when they have to rule on it, it could come out earlier. So that that's the that's the Demodex medication. I'm starting to get your virtual thank yous here. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, just say thank you for doing this for us. And uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, thank you for listening to Ocular Complications of Common Systemic Medications. This was a synchronous virtual course.